Let me show you something interesting. This is our main repo with a bunch of uh, different automations. It's basically most of the Python code that we write at Iron Code is in this backend repo. So this does a bunch of stuff. It integrates with APIs, databases, it uh, listens to events from payment providers, etc. Let me search for data classes. As you can see, there is my examples repo as well that has, uh, what is it, almost 800 uses of data classes, but my backend repo doesn't even show up here. It looks like I'm not using data classes at all in our backends. So when I first noticed this, I was very surprised. Like, what? I'm promoting data classes all over the channel? Basically, really like the feature in Python, and when I look for it, we're not even using it? What's going on? But then I realized I am actually still using data classes, but probably not in the way that you think. But before I talk about that, let's do a quick recap of what data classes in Python actually do and how it differs from other third-party packages such as Pydantic. In short, I've already talked about this in lots of other videos, a data class is a simple way to create classes that store data. And it's part of the data classes module. And this is part of the Python standard library. So, what you can do is you can specify a decorator and then you can create a class, let's say a book, and that book has a title and it may have an author, it may have a year, it may have other things as well. And the nice thing about data classes is that you can specify the instance variables in this way. And then the data class decorator is going to automatically create an initializer for you. It's going to create a, a wrapper for this particular uh, book class. It's going to do uh, object comparison and a couple of other things as well. So because this is now a data class, I can simply create a book and then I can print that book. And when I run this, then this is what we get. So it gives me a nice, useful representation. Whereas if this is not a data class, so now there's all sorts of things that are not there. For example, the book initializer is basically empty because it's not being generated. So I need to do that manually. And also when I print it, it's not going to give me a lot of information because if I create a book like so, and uh, then I run this, then it gives me a book objects, very low level thing at some memory address, right? So data class solve that problem and make it easier to deal with classes and objects that contain data. Now there's lots of other cool features that they add, such as a frozen option read only. You have control over what should be added as an argument to the initializer, uh, being able to use slots for better performance and a bunch of other things. Like I said, it's part of the standard library for quite a while since Python 3.7. So there's no external dependencies. It's tied to Python's own versioning, which can be helpful. And that means it's easy to maintain across different environments. And that's actually a huge win, um, especially compared to third-party libraries that sometimes, well, I'd say disagree with each other. In short, data classes sound like a great feature. So why am I not using it? Well, before I talk about that, let's first go over some of the alternatives. And the main one that I want to mention is Pydantic. Pydantic is a bit like data classes. It's not part of the standard library, but the main thing that Pydantic adds is validation, plus a couple of other features as well. And that's why it's used often by frameworks like FastAPI, where you know validation is kind of useful if you have an API. Now, in the past, we had some compatibility issues because of that, like FastAPI depended on Pydantic v1. You had SQL Alchemy for database access was also changing quite a bit. And at the same time, Pydantic v2 changed a lot of APIs. And managing these versions wasn't always fun. If you were around in 2023, 2024, you probably remember. Like I mentioned, Pydantic is deeply integrated into fast API. In the request and the response models, there's validation and parsing. Uh, there's a type coercion. That's also a feature of Pydantic, so converting a string 1 to 3 into an int 1 to 3 automatically. So that means it's really natural to use FastAPI and Pydantic together. Here you see an example of that. So I have a FastAPI app. I have my book class for which I'm not using a data class because, well, it's easier with FastAPI to use Pydantic because that's what it integrates with. We have a function to generate some ID. I just built something that looks a bit like a MongoDB object ID. And then you have a bunch of endpoints, right? Creating book, getting a book, listing books, etc. Pretty basic. And then we can run this API. 
And this is pretty straightforward using UV. And what you can do now is send a request. So in this case, I'm sending a request to this API that retrieves box. And as you can see, of course, uh, when you create this, there is simply an empty dictionary. There is no box whatsoever. There's nothing here. But then what I can do is post a request to create a book. And then later on, when I retrieve the list of books, then this is what I get. So very basic way of how an API works, right? Now an issue here is that book right here is used for both representing a book and for representing what a request like creating a book expects, right? It's also being used here. And that's not great because you would expect a book in a database, for example, to have some sort of ID. And it also results in a weird design where if you look at create book, we have to return this dictionary containing an ID and the actual book. And same for a get book. So it gets an ID and it gets a book from the dictionary. And that's kind of confusing. Ideally, you'd want to return purely a list of book objects, but that's not possible because a book here doesn't have an ID. I could add an ID, but then I'd need to supply it when creating a book. Okay, you can maybe make it optional, but the list of books that you store in your uh, database or in your memory, well, books need an ID, so it's not optional. So it's it's not really a Python problem, actually, or a fast API or a Pydantic problem. This is actually a data modeling problem. So you might wonder, well, is that maybe a place where you could use data classes? And the answer is yes, maybe. So here's another version of that API that now uses a data class, a book class, to model the internal representation of a book, right? And as you can see, it has an ID field now, which uses generate ID as a default factory. So when you create a book instance, it's going to create an ID. And then on top of that, we have now new Pydantic models for creating a book, which has a title, author and pages, and for a book response, which is an ID, a title, author, and pages. I have my fake database again, and then I have my routes. And now I can do uh, this, where I'm basically supplying a response model. So that gives my fast API app the information about what kind of thing this response. And same thing for getting the books. The response model is a book response. And for getting all the books, we have a list of book response objects. So that's very neat. So you might say, okay, great. So that's what we can use data classes for. But of course, in a real application, this is probably not what you would do. In a real application, you'd probably use a database. And the package that you might commonly use for this is SQL Alchemy. And this is the same example, but this time around, it works with a real database. Or at least it works with a SQLite database. But you can change this URL so that it's a real database in a cloud. So very simply said, I have my database engine set up stuff here. And then I have my SQL Alchemy ORM model. So that's basically what we had as a data class before, where I have an ID, I have a title, author, and pages. And then again, I have my Pydantic models for creating a book and returning a book. And then finally, well, we have some uh, boilerplate code for uh, getting the ID, which we're going to inject in the endpoints. So that's what's happening here. And then finally, we interact with this database to uh, create books, uh, retrieve books, uh, and everything that we want to do with books. So what happened here is that we got a bit closer to what a production application would look like. The data classes disappeared. Now, it's possible that you actually still like the data classes approach of having a data class decorator, right? Instead of this uh, inheritance relationship that we have here. Well, Pydantic does support two ways of defining the models. So this is the classic way of doing it. But there's also a newer way of doing it, which is using Pydantic style data classes. And that's what this looks like. So it's very close to how the built-in data classes works, as you can see right here. So you can use either of these two. There are some differences between Pydantic style data classes and the base model. In a sense, base model has more features because the Pydantic data class follows the standard library data class very closely. Here have another example where I'm using both a data class and a base model to define various types of models. So I have a book model, for example, using the Pydantic data class as type one pages, and it has a validator to check that pages is positive. That's one of the things you can do with Pydantic, right? 
And then I have an author class that is a base model. So that's the other way of defining the models in Pydantic. It also has a validator by H. Now there are some limitations to Pydantic style data classes because it closely follows the standard library implementation of it. One of them is that it doesn't do type coercion. So if you create, let's say, a book uh, with uh, string pages, that doesn't work. Whereas for an author, uh, you can actually do that. So for example, if I run this code where I try to create a bad book with a string as pages, then it's going to result in a validation error. As you can see, it wants input to be a valid integer. However, if I have the author here, which is a base model, Pydantic model, and I change age to be a string, like so. So of course I get a type issue here. However, if I run this, then I don't get any error at all. It simply just converts the type into an int. And there's more uh, missing features from the Pydantic style data classes. For example, you can do model dump, which creates a dictionary or JSON style version of the object because model dump is not implemented on that. It's only implemented on the base model. So even though Pydantic data class made few more Pythonic, they do lack a lot of important features. Finally, these Pydantic style data classes don't work all that well with FastAPI. For example, if you try to change the response model to a Pydantic data class, it doesn't work. And by the way, if you want to learn how to design better software from scratch, check out my free design guide at r0code slash design guide. This includes the seven steps that I use for building real project links in the description. So even Pydantic style data classes are actually too limited. So it looks like that whatever I do, it, I seem to end up with code that doesn't use data classes. What these examples show is that when you're looking at production code, you're often dependent on data structures that are used by your favorite libraries. FastAPI, SQL Alchemy, Pandas, etc. And typically, just the standard library data classes don't have the required features that those libraries need, so they use something else. FastAPI needs extensive validation, so it uses Pydantic and not the built-in data classes. Pandas has its own data frame structure. It doesn't use a data class for each row in a data frame because that's not efficient enough and it's missing important features. And since we often rely on libraries like this to write our Python code, you're going to use those structures instead of a data class from the standard library. So it seems like data classes are mostly useless then. But here's the interesting thing. I actually still use data classes. And how I like to use them is not for these types of scripts or automations. I actually use them a lot for prototyping. For example, if I'm trying to come up with a model for a certain domain and uh, get an understanding of how everything works together, I could, of course, make a bunch of diagrams with Mermaid, you know, uh, write some stuff in uh, Markdown or whatever, or I could uh, get a paper and a pen or do it in Canva or whatever, or uh, use some of these online drawing tools. Now instead, what I like to do is define a couple of data classes, one for each concept in the domain. And then I use ChatGPT a lot to then discuss the domain and iterate over that Python code. And for me, that actually works really well because I find data classes is really easy to read. It's very quick to just write a data class, code up some relationships between classes, write some simple example code to figure out how it all fits together, etc. So to me, data classes are really useful for, well, let's just call it what it is, vibe domain modeling. And of course, I use data classes a lot in my examples because they allow me to give you a very simple representation of something without having to depend on a database or other things. But I'd like to hear from you. Do you use data classes in production code? What's your main use case for them? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, I've talked about Pydantic and data classes before, and there's also Atters. It's the package that data classes are based on. If you want to learn more about that and see a deeper comparison between the pros and cons of each, check out this video next. Thanks for watching and see you next time.